live from the Congress Center in London, England. It's The Cube at MIT and the digital economy, the second machine age. Brought to you by headline sponsor, MIT. Welcome back to London, everybody. This is Dave Vellante. This is theCUBE. We're here at MIT IDE. It's been a day-long event, really around the book, The Second Machine Age, written by Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee. Jean-Jacques de Groof is here. He's an MIT alum, a PhD, and we attended the session today. Jean-Jacques, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks so much for coming Thank on. You. So, Thank of course, you. you were at MIT for a number of years in the early part of the 90s, well into the 2000s. Uh, you're here as a guest today, listening to the, to the content. What did you think about the event today? Well, it's a wonderful event. I think uh, the authors spelled very clearly the, the qualitative change from the industrial era to this digital economy. Uh, a message that we uh, all need to, to hear and to, to disseminate, in, in my view. Uh, because uh, still most companies, uh, most leaders in uh, our leading companies don't realize, don't realize this, this qualitative change going on. We were talking off camera and you, you shared with me one of your passions is education. Yeah. Um, not surprising. But helping young people navigate through the changes in the digital economy is one of the biggest changes that is going to necessitate a change in the way in which we teach our young people. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. What do you see, what do you prescribe, what would you like to see happen in education for young people? Yeah, when I, I came out of, the, of this conference with thousands of ideas in, <laughs> in my head, of course, but one of them is about the implication of this new digital economy on education and on what we need to and how we need to teach our children. Um, we see, we saw charts uh, from Eric Greenhouseon showing the stagnation of wages, showing also the divergence of income between the college graduates the, and and those who do not have a college graduation, and. Um, uh, it's not only uh, a problem, uh, a situation uh, in the, that's in the United States, but uh, in Europe as well. Uh, my wife is Spanish, and uh, so I know Spain well. For, just to give you an example, Spain had uh, not long ago more than 5 million unemployed people. It has improved a little bit, slightly, not much uh, in the last few months. Uh, half of them don't have a secondary education. They have not completed secondary education. Um, um, also, 35% uh, of uh, students in Spain dr drop off of high school. So I really wonder, uh, and that's Spain, but I think it, you know, it's probably true of most of Southern Europe, perhaps it's a little bit better in Northern Europe, uh, most probably, but um, uh, how do we prepare our educated children to the new digital economy, but also how do we deal with this population of uh, young people who dropped off? Why such a high drop-off rate? Uh, obviously, they're not becoming, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates billionaires. No. Why? Is it because we're teaching them the wrong things? Are we not engaging them correctly? Uh, do they have to work for for other reasons uh, to help their families? Why such a high drop-off rate? Um, well, Andrew McAfee touched upon the fact that. The way we educate children hasn't changed much in the last uh, 200 years and is no longer well uh, uh, adapted to, to this new economy. We, our model of education was built when we needed to produce uh, clerks and workers on, uh, in, in the factory. So basically people who repeat it mechanically and uh, 
day after day what, what they, they were told to, be, to, to do. Uh, nowadays, uh, we need another profile of workers uh, that have more initiatives, creativity, but the educational methods and models uh, have not much uh, changed. So I think young people are indeed uh, bored uh, at, at, at school. So that could be one explanation, but just one part of the uh, small part of the story. Um, we, we are experiencing a de-industrialization de de in Europe. Uh, we have long-term uh, unemployment. Uh, in Belgium, where I'm from, uh, for instance, in, we have instances of third generation of unemployed people. means young people who have not seen their parents work, neither their grandparents. So there is a kind of desperation uh, around and uh, I hear so, such, some of these people, these young people say, well, why study if there is no future? Of course, it's a wrong. Uh, it's 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 a wrong analysis. A terribly wrong analysis. It's a, what they should reach exactly the opposite conclusion. But it's a fact. So I want to ask you about your your PhD is in commercializing science yes. essentially. I would I would term it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but taking R and D and actually turn it into something that it can be you know, commercially viable. Yes. So uh, and you. So that's a fascinating uh, topic. We, I, we see companies all the time, especially large companies, have a very difficult time translating R&D into commercially viable products. They tend to do very poor at R&D and they tend to, uh, to go buy companies to, yeah. to, to inorganically create value. What do you see as going on in terms of that transference of R&D into commercialized products? Where are we at today? Well, compared to uh, 20 years ago, we, we've made uh, a great progress, and um, MIT has been a precursor in 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 doing that. And uh, people from all over the world come visit MIT to see to try to understand the secret sauce, <laughs> if there is any. Um, and uh, in Europe, more more specifically. Uh, it's a very new thing for universities to consider dealing with industry, to consider turning their research into ventures, into commercialized uh, products. But uh, they are considering it now, whereas years ago it was dealing with industry was... Why is it so hard? I mean, the United States... Is seems relatively easy, although we complain about government roadblocks all the time, but why is it harder in Europe? It's hard in Europe because, uh, and I, when I say Europe, I'm, I'm meaning continental Europe, mostly. Great Britain is a little bit of a special yeah, okay. case. It's, it's, it's difficult because when people, founders of companies, policy makers, etc., people, investors, talk about entrepreneurship in Europe, what they really mean most of the time is self-employment. Ah. It's not uh, to, to create, to grab a, that huge opportunity, create a company, try to make it grow, become a global leader, go public or whatever, or becoming the next Google just to take right, this right. It's more kind of image. Thing yes, I see. No, the, idea, the, the concept of entrepreneurship in New Europe, unfortunately, is still very much to create what's one song company uh, that provides a good income, an interesting activity, what we call the lifestyle company. There is nothing wrong about lifestyle companies, oh. of course, but uh, I'm convinced that what the uh, what our economies uh, need, what our societies need in Europe, are growth-oriented uh, uh, startups. So. Uh, that's one problem. Um, an, 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 another problem is that um, you, universities, for instance, universities in, in general, are a little greedy. 
Uh, they, How so? What do you mean? They, what I mean by that is that they tend to think that uh, they are going to make a lot of money with these startups, these ah. spin-offs. Oh, they have. They want to lick off the cone. So and yes. <laughs> so they, when, when they when they negotiate, they deal. They they make. They sell their their li They license their IP, their intellectual property to these uh, young founders, young scientists becoming entrepreneurs. The universities are too. Uh, they 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 want too much of the ownership of the company, or they want royalties that are much too high. So basically, what they do is they, they kill the company before it was born. Restricted growth, yeah. Right. Okay, Jean-Jacques, I'm sorry, we're out of time. We have to leave it there. Thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. It was really a pleasure to you. Okay, keep it right there, buddy. We'll be back with our next guest right after this word. This is theCUBE, we're live from MIT IDE in London. We'll be right back. <laughs>